Let's kick off this look back at 2011 with a summarization of the LeBron James Dwayne Wade relationship. Holy shit, I need to join that guy. Thank God I joined that guy. You know, there's nothing quite like LeBron false narratives to make me go back and look at other players again. Quite frankly, I think Dwayne Wade was a more impressive athlete. I think he was a more skilled player. You know, LeBron was bigger and can jump high. And he used that move repeatedly. And that evolved to the NBA, allowing him to actually illegally use his size. Dwayne Wade did at 6'4", what LeBron James is celebrated for doing at 6'9". I haven't seen much of this from LeBron James. His bag is based on size dominance and someone else setting him up. I mean, how familiar does this look to 2024? LeBron James with an easy, uncontested dunk made possible thanks to teammates. Looks like the Mavericks are concerned about Dwayne Wade there to me. The LeBron excuse train was already rolling heavy and hard back then. I remember people saying that Dwayne Wade was washed. Yeah, hit the gym, bitch. Funny, it was the older of the two that was still fighting and clawing as the 2011 finals were starting to slip away. In the meantime, LeBron had slipped away. And D. Wade had to learn the hard way exactly what LeBron's shortcomings were in the 2011 finals. He, what, he was... MIA. He had a bad he had a bad game. No, he had a bad series. Yeah. No, a bad series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell does Shannon Sharp mean? Yeah. (laughs) When he just corrects you that it wasn't a bad game, it was a bad series. That isn't what you were saying, you goddamn fanboy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This graphic is not LeBron James as a rookie. This is seven seasons in. Novitsky inside the Chandler block. Oh, what a block from Wade! A spectacular defensive play. Wade inside and banks it in. Comes right back down the other end. You go back and watch that fourth quarter, and D. Wade is doing heroic things. I mean, he's taking it on himself to actually try to stop the elimination. And where's LeBron James? I almost released this video at the beginning of the season, and I'm glad I didn't because LeBron provided more fuel for the fire. He and his delusional ego and general douchebaggery, discrediting his time with the Miami Heat, saying that he was always going to be as great as he was. As classless as his comments were, of course, Nick Wright defended him, using his two NBA MVP awards as evidence. Well, a lot of people don't think LeBron deserved those MVPs. Dwayne Wade even publicly said he deserved the MVP over LeBron. Nick Wright made a point to say repeatedly on his show that it wasn't even close. No one was even close to LeBron in getting those MVPs. Really? Because Dwayne Wade actually had more points than LeBron James, more assists than LeBron James, and almost as many rebounds. Kobe was only getting two points less per game. And many people think what Kobe did with those particular Lakers was more impressive than what LeBron did. In fact, what LeBron did was fizzle out in the playoffs, and Kobe won the championship. I watched LeBron quit on his team. Anyone who quits on their team cannot be an MVP. (laughs) That alone should have had the award stripped from him. I spoil a lot of people with my play. I spoil a lot of people with my play. I spoil a lot of people with my play. Classy from the very beginning, weren't you, LeBron James? Yep, I remember that comment. I mean, I remember when he said it. Watching him quit, followed by saying that. Woo! You want to talk about when (laughs) I realized this guy was not worth cheering for. Let's look at the 2010 MVP award really quick, too. And I'll start with points because I know LeBron fans are infatuated with points. Well, number two in MVP voting was Kevin Durant who had more points per game and more assists per game. Kobe Bryant was a near third, and once again, Kobe Bryant took his team to the championship. 
So now I'm sure you're backpedaling and saying, well, there's more to it than scoring. Yeah, except that I can summarize LeBron James as the recipient of Alley-Oops Guy. That's his nickname, Recipient of Alley-Oops Guy, which particularly goes for his time in Miami when he was given another MVP in 2012, despite being Alley-Oop Guy and Kevin Durant once again beating him in two categories, but LeBron James nevertheless receiving the votes. But these undeserved accolades that LeBron has gathered over the years, including but not limited to stealing Rookie of the Year from Carmelo Anthony, allow people like Nick Wright ammunition when they want to defend a bogus claim in the present. These are lies supporting lies. You have a bad game here or there. You had three bad games in a seven-year career. The douchebaggery is just off the charts even back then. Three bad games in your career by your own assessment. <laughs> I think that was following a 15.9 turnover game. But you heard out of LeBron's own mouth, he was seven years in. So when he disappeared in the finals in 2011, there's no blaming being a rookie. There's no blaming anything other than he just wasn't that guy. And the Miami Heat paid for it. To say that LeBron didn't need the Miami Heat is just crazy, because clearly his confidence was still not there. He was not ever going to get over that hump unless he was carried, literally carried, by other players. Third highest scorer on his own team. Eighth year in the league and supposedly had already earned regular season MVP awards. It's difficult listening to the mindless lemurs who repeat what they've been told to say, such as LeBron didn't have any help. When it's so far from the truth, LeBron wasn't even the best player on his own team. Once again, what was true then, is true again today. Regarding the arguments that LeBron didn't build a super team, or when that argument falls flat, they turn to, well, he wasn't the first one to do it. Let's take a deeper look. D-Wade and LeBron were ranked the number one and two players in the East when they teamed up. Number one and number two teamed up. That's already cowardly. Remember, D-Wade might have been more deserving of league MVP the very season before they teamed up. And he teamed up with a guy who did win the MVP. But an absurd team up isn't enough when it comes to LeBron James. No, let's add Toronto Raptors franchise player Chris Bosh, who had already made the All-Star team five times before leaving Toronto to become part of LeBron's collusion with D-Wade. When Bosh left the Raptors, listen to this. Yes, the same team where Vince Carter had played. He was already the franchise's all-time leader in points, rebounds, blocks, and minutes played. He eclipsed Vince Carter. That's all. That's the guy that he added to D-Wade and LeBron. <laughs> Wait, no, that's not all, actually. Bosch was also selected to represent Team USA in 2008 and was part of bringing back the gold. If you haven't watched my Redeem Team video, I recommend that you do. It was kind of clear that LeBron was looking at these guys and realizing he needed either Kobe or D-Wade or a combination of the league's elite to help overcome his own deficiencies. Remember, it was D-Wade and Kobe that shined in the end and brought the gold when the going got tough. So why not D-Wade, Miami's franchise player, already an NBA champion, and the finals MVP of that championship. I repeat, MVP of the finals he won. He was an all-star in six consecutive seasons leading up to the collusion team. Let's look back in history for a little perspective on this. Have you seen this ridiculous animation that tries to compare LeBron's journey to Michael Jordan's journey? It would have actually been fun if they would have had a similar path and we could have compared it on an even playing field. But LeBron leaving Cleveland and doing what he did would have been like in 1987-88, Michael Jordan selecting two guys in the East, such as Charles Barkley, who off that season 
was averaging 28 points, 12 rebounds, and four assists per game. And saying, hey, let's team up. But not stopping there. Then take a look at the guy who came in second to Michael Jordan in scoring that season, Dominique Wilkins, who averaged 31 points, six rebounds, and three assists, and saying, you come join us too. Dominique was just nasty. I think he's the last person I would ever want to dunk on me. I mean, he looks like he's going to break your hand. Look at him destroy Robert Parrish. And you know what? You might as well add Larry Bird to the mix so you have someone with previous championship experience. Got enough yet? Is this going to do it for you? If MJ had actually taken this approach to winning, he could have gotten 10 rings and we wouldn't think of him the same way. LeBron's team was so stacked that he arrogantly declared that they would get eight titles. And you know what? They probably should have with that team. So the fact that he failed despite a ridiculous advantage should hurt his legacy. I feel it's appropriate to compare it to Scottie Pippen since LeBron fans like to pretend that Jordan couldn't have done it without Scottie and Scottie was basically some sort of basketball god. Well. Here are Scotty's career averages. Go ahead and take a look at that. Now look at Chris Bosch. Mm-hmm. Career averages. Now look at Dwayne Wade's career averages. And these are two guys who barely get any credit in LeBron's timeline, yet absolutely blow Scotty Pippen out of the water. Now let's look at Scotty's peak season and compare that to Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Let me point something out to you. Chris Bosh came off his best season ever. He was peaking when LeBron James got him. Dwayne Wade was one season removed from his best scoring season when he joined LeBron James. That's ridiculous. Now we come to the next backpedaling argument of LeBron fans that say, well, maybe those guys were great, but the rest of the team was trash. Let me tell you something. If your team is that stacked, the rest of the roster should be trash just to try and even things out a little bit. But the reality is they were not trash. They consisted of people who were good enough to be starters on that professional team the previous season. So I'm not sure how people who are starters in the NBA are suddenly trash. You know, the Miami Heat didn't go grab the rest of the roster at the local YMCA. Look the previous season. Chalmers was good enough to already be the starting shooting guard for the Heat before the Super Team collusion. So you just added people to that. You can also include Joel Anthony and Carlos Arroyo in the group who were good enough to start for a pro team, but were just trash. Once the LeBron I Need Superheroes party showed up and Udonis Haslam's all-round play and experience has been there the entire time. Well, let's just throw that out the window. A previous champion, a veteran. LeBron brought Ilgauskas from Cleveland. So how bad could Ilgauskas have been? He was an Olympian for his own country. Recruited to Miami. And how about Eddie House? Fresh off a championship run in Boston. Not even worth mentioning. Not even worth mentioning as an asset. Is he a Hall of Famer? Is he top 75? No. Does that make someone trash? Not everybody can be top 75. Not everybody can be a Hall of Famer. This idea that your entire team should be stacked with the best of the best of the best and that that's fair or competitive, it just speaks volumes for how bad things have become in both the NBA and society. You don't think all that extra championship experience was helpful? Michael Jordan had zero players with prior finals experience on his team. They all went through the fire together. And he took them. As absurd as this roster already is. I didn't mention Juwan Howard. I didn't mention Jerry Stackhouse. Mike Miller was not trash. How about Mike Bibby? A little trip down memory lane regarding Eddie House, since, as is the case with most of LeBron's teammates who get thrown in the trash in order to lift the perception of LeBron's own legacy, look at these headlines from when the Heat faced the Thunder. Eddie House was crucial in those games. Most of you probably don't know who Eddie House is, and that's by design. 
Yet, you think that John Paxson and Steve Kerr are gods because they hit some shots. Yet, you don't even know who Eddie House is. Interesting. LeBron almost looks jealous already. The number of ways this team up was despicable is so long, I'm only now getting to the fact that it was illegal. And LeBron lied about it on national television, claiming that he only just reached his decision before his televised decision event. When in reality, he and Wade had spoken about it well in advance and the plan had started coming together as early as 2006 when they were together on the U.S. national team and discussed again at the 2008 Olympics. Pat Riley, who has been guilty of more than a few shady moves in his career, refrained from making any moves to help the Heat roster while Dwayne Wade was there for two years in order to have money to pay LeBron James when he arrived. LeBron's desire to keep this officially a secret so he could reveal it in a one hour televised event rather than let the Cavaliers, whom he supposedly loved, know what his plans were so that they could make preparations and move on and change the roster accordingly was also distasteful. And he did the same thing to Miami when he left there. You see, LeBron has been this guy from the beginning. And his disgusting antics have carried on throughout his entire career. Even now, the only thing that has changed is how ESPN, the media at large, and society have shifted to forgive and accept his disgusting behavior. Allow me to read an article from the National Post dating back to the season before LeBron left. Quote, in the second round against Boston, the series was tied 2-2 when LeBron quit. He stood around on offense as if in a stupor. He played straight-legged defense. He blamed a sore elbow and came back with monster numbers in game six, but it was an illusion. LeBron repeatedly made incomprehensible basketball decisions. Cleveland lost and the Cavaliers jersey was off before he reached the locker room. One Celtics official later said he saw a guy who just figured he couldn't win and stopped trying. In the free agency, Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron James were all three represented by Creative Artists Agency, a group with tentacles in the film, television, music, and sports industries. And all three spun the media like a top. I wanted to do what was best for LeBron James, said LeBron James, and what LeBron James was going to do to make him happy. I'm going to be happy with the decision that I've made, and I'm just going to continue to be great. It was breathtaking narcissism, comprehensive cluelessness, all aided and abated by ESPN. End quotes. Says a lot, doesn't it? Rather than punishing these players when they behave in such a way, they're promoted. The media finds a way that they can benefit from it. ESPN has been there for the entire LeBron James ride. Each and every season, new ways are found to explain LeBron's behavior and tell the world that what he does is okay, no matter how despicable it may first appear. Anyway, I could go on forever, just on 2010, 2011 alone. And I will, but in a future episode. Let me know what you thought of this one. Let me know in the comments. I appreciate it. And if you're itching for more of this type of content, I pretty much already covered the 2013 Super Team carrying LeBron James in my video that compared the bailout shots. So I'll link that one here.